I know I already <coughs> mentioned it, but I'm going to mention it again. Um, we are not meeting next week. Uh, that's the, the week between Christmas and New Year's. We are not going to be having a Wednesday night meeting, and then we will be back January 3rd. So I had mentioned that, but hadn't gotten that on the recording. So just to make sure that everybody knows, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's on and going through. <laughs> All right. So last week, we finished out the um, idea of man. And what is man? Um, what has God created as mankind? And this week we are turning our attention to the issue of salvation. Now this is a larger section. There's a lot of verses and a lot of things to discuss and go into, so I don't anticipate finishing all of it this week. But we're going to jump in and see how far we can get. The doctrinal statement says, We believe that salvation is freely available by faith to all mankind. Jesus Christ is the propitiation of our sins and also the sins of the whole world, redeeming us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Thus, mankind is saved on the simple and single ground of his shed blood. This free gift of salvation, with its forgiveness of sins, its impartation of new nature, and its hope of eternal life is entirely apart from good works or mankind's efforts and is by grace through faith. Salvation comes by putting your trust in Christ alone. Each true believer is eternally, eternally secured by God so that he cannot lose his salvation, but sin may interrupt the joy of his fellowship with God and bring God's loving discipline upon him. So what... Just from that, just from reading that, what stands out to you as significant or um, maybe different than other people's takes on salvation or um, of major importance as you go through it? That you can't lose your salvation once okay. you've received it okay. or accepted it. You cannot lose your salvation. That's a major one. Okay? Um, I think that... Uh, as we were going through this lesson, it's realizing that even though we are saved, and if we make mistakes, God will still discipline us. So okay. that it, it reminds me so much of the family. We love our children, but they will disappoint us at times, and we will have to discipline. Yeah. And that's the way God is with us. And he is not just someone that's going to agree with everything that we do. We still have to be responsible mm -hmm. and, and walk by the Holy Spirit. When we, when we do sin, He does lovingly discipline us, but He does discipline us. But He does discipline us. Okay. We will be getting into that one quite a bit. And, and it's available to all mankind if they accept it. Okay, that it is available to all. I think that that is a, a distinctive, and that is something that I emphasize quite a bit um, because I have had a lot of interactions with people who um, disagree with that idea. Um, but I, I think Scripture is very clear that it is available to all. That doesn't mean that everyone's going to accept it, but everyone could accept it if they would simply bow the knee and trust Christ. Yes, sir. Yeah, that uh, sin interrupts the joy of his fellowship with God. Okay. I think people take that way too lightly and don't take it seriously. And one thing that I'll have to talk to Jim or some of the other guys, I really don't like the word may. Sin automatically interrupts. Okay. I'm not going to change the doctrinal statement, but, you know, that's kind of weird why may was put in there. Okay. I don't know of any sin that doesn't interrupt. <coughs> oh, you're looking at me like old Paul. So. <laughs> well, no, the, the well, wording of that is worth worth considering. I won't, I won't deny. We, we will uh, discuss that one as we get to it, perhaps. But that is a good Perhaps, question. or is that a may? That's a may. <laughs> <laughs> and I use may because I could very easily perhaps. forget that. <laughs> I use perhaps because I could very easily forget that one. Um, but yeah, that's that's worth considering. Um, okay. Another thing that I've thought about over the years, and my husband used to say this all the time, is that 
when it talks about salvation, that people will confess and that they say they confess and everything, that they accept the Lord and everything. And uh, my husband said there's two kinds of that. There's people who do it for the insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Just in case that this is true, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other side of the coin where people do it for assurance. It's their assurance that they have salvation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that is something that uh, sometimes when we just say it's just open for all and everybody can do it and if we take it too light, even when when we offer the gospel message to people, that it's, it's a very serious thing that they're doing. God knows the heart. Yep. And they can't just do it lightly off the top and say, oh, okay, just in case this happens, you know, what the Bible says happens, I want to have my insurance. I'm all paid up. Yeah, it's not, it's not an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Go ahead. Before I forget, yep. I would like to address the May. Oh, oh okay. Good. I think something popped in my head. Um, if I remember correctly, what we're talking about here is a new believer can be totally excited, and what it's saying may interrupt the joy of his fellowship. A new believer may have complete joy in fellowship with the Lord and have no idea they're sinning in a variety of ways in their life. I've been a believer 40 years, two, 42, and still I find things in there that go, oh man, I could do that a lot better. Hmm. I don't think those kinds of things, the, the unknown sins to us, I don't think they interrupt the joy and the fellowship with God. God recognizes He's dealing with broken pieces when He's dealing with us and people that don't get it and we're not all knowing. And I, I think that's what we were talking about here is that there's the, what are the two terms for it? One is willful sin and the other is sin of ignorance or I can't Sins remember the term. Sins of omission and commission? Is that what you're referring to? Or and, and, yeah, ignorance that's more and a Catholic term. I think there's a different... But it's the idea of sins you don't even know you're committing. It's the okay. blind spots that we have in our lives that uh, if you've been a believer very long at all, you'll have somebody come along and kind of point out something in your life that you could definitely be more Christ-like in. Mm. And, and, and if you don't know about that, it's not going to impact your joy in your fellowship with God, he's, getting, he's going, okay, I will bring you there September 3rd of 2026, but for right now, you're as mature as, as you are, and I'm, I'm willing to work with that because your desire is, is to please is, me. Is that where sanctification comes in? Where I think that, yeah, throw it, that's the throw process. It's more like thing. Christ because yeah. we're, we start out Quite a ways away, but we yeah, we're not like Christ. Closer, right? It's a, I, I believe it's a, so. It's part of that sanctification learning process. Does that make sense? So it makes sense. I was thinking more of the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve or uh, quench the Holy Spirit, and that's because of sinning. And I'm saying, well, if you're, you're grieving, willfully, and cho willfully <coughs> choosing. No, no. As soon as you said unknowing, I wrote it down. Okay. I wrote it down. <laughs> I, I'm so pretty sure that's what we're talking about. Yeah. If I can try and summarize, I, correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying that the may refers to may interrupt joy, not may interrupt fellowship. Because sin, particularly willful sin, will interrupt fellowship. But the joy well, aspect, the awareness of it, is dependent on our understanding and our experience and, and whether or not but so God has brought us to do fellowship. Is a part of that. Okay. I really do. I mean, like I said, a new believer doesn't have a clue of all the sin that he's doing in his life. Mm -hmm. He's just in fellowship with God, and he's delighting in God, and he just wants to tell everybody he's excited about it, he or she. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what I'm saying is that the sins you're not aware of. It's when you willfully sin, 
it absolutely, like Paul said, it absolutely interrupts the joy and the fellowship. Okay. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's one of the Psalms. I, th I think we will be addressing some of that as we get to Hebrews. But, yes, ma'am. Uh, just a little throwing it out there. Thinking about love and the depth of love and fellowship, and the depth of fellowship as we draw closer to Christ. That new believer thinks they are like in high heaven, right there, this close to God. Just like a new bride or a new couple think that they are like the deepest love ever possible. But then after you've spent time with Christ, you've gotten rid of a lot of those things, you've drawn closer, that fellowship is so much deeper and sweeter yeah. than you ever knew the possibility possibly be, just like Mary just the same. Can you turn the microphone on? <laughs> <laughs> he said all that again. <laughs> no. That's okay. Okay. See? That See? No. Now you can hear it. You couldn't hear that before. The comparison of uh, knowing and drawing closer to Christ and knowing and drawing closer to a spouse is kind of the, the comparison you're making. Yes. Gotcha. All right. Well, I think, I think we will be um, dealing with several of those as we go through. Now, in the, in the handout, I asked you to define a couple of words that come up in the statement. And so let's start off with define free. What does free mean? It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't cost, cost anything. Doesn't have cost, doesn't cost Without anything. Without bondage. Okay. Not under the control or in the power of another. Okay. <clears throat> Not a slave. Not a slave. Okay. I think I think we're dealing with two two types of free as we're mm -hmm. as we're getting these definitions, which is good um, and good to be aware of. So salvation is free, and it makes us free. And those are the two different uses of that. So thank you for for identifying both of those. Let's go with the first one. Salvation is free. Uh, you said it is without cost or payment, right? Um, so is salvation really free? Did it? Go ahead. It, you may not have to pay for it, but I do not believe it's truly free because you have to give up. There is a personal cost. To, yeah. you, you know, you're giving up your sin life Okay. in, in some cases. Okay. It's definitely not free. Christ paid his life for it. Okay. Without cost to me. Without cost to me. Okay. Right. It's the free gift that costs you everything. That's right. <laughs> so the, the doctrinal statement starts off, we believe that salvation is freely available by faith to all mankind. So that's where I'm pulling this, this question of what's meant by free. And in that... I would say that it is without cost to me, which is what Liz could point it out. But, as you mentioned, it, had, it came at a great cost, at a huge price, namely the life of Christ, that he had to die on the cross for us. But he paid for it, and therefore it is of no cost to us to receive salvation. Now, as, as you have both pointed out, the, the follow-on results are different than the reception of the gift. And so we, we will be talking about those as well. But, um, so it is free without me having to pay for it because Christ gives it to me. Just like, I mean, we're in Christmas season. You're going to be giving a lot of gifts and it costs the recipient nothing and yet it costs you whatever it costs to purchase, obtain, make, whatever that gift. So... Uh, good comparison. Okay, now to the other, uh, we are made free, and I think there were there were several uh, comments on out of bondage, uh, no longer slave to. I don't remember what what were the other comments made on that one. Not under control. Okay. Or Not the under power control. of. I, I saw where uh, 1658 was was what we were just talking about now, and 1659 was meant exempt from liability. Okay. Exempt from liability. So are we then free 
released from all bondage, no longer a slave. And yet we become a slave of Christ. We become a bond servant of Christ. So we're made free from sin to become a slave to Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we are made free, but again, so it's the same as that idea of salvation being without cost, free to us, great cost to Christ. We are made free from sin. We are no longer bound to that, but instead we are bound by Christ. And that goes into that follow-on that you mentioned previously. Um, any other comments on free? It's not... Neither one is bound by an obligation, if you will. Okay. No obligation on our part. Although, there, again, there is an obligation. Yes. <laughs> but receive it, it results in, but it's not caused by. The availability is still free. Yeah. All right. Um, the next one that I had is define sin. I know we've, we've done that a few times already. We're going to continue to, and actually that will come up in section 9. That whole section is about sin, sin but... For, for this point, what is a working definition of sin? The one that you hear quite often is to miss the mark. Okay. Okay. A technical definition is to miss the mark. And that's, that's really what it comes from, um, an archery term. Violating a divine law or command. Okay. I've got transcription of God's law. Just one of the things I've got right now. That's what, I that's what you got? Okay. Yep. <laughs> anything you think, say, or do contrary to the character of God. All right. That's a, that's a Anything you one. think, say, or do contrary to the character of God. Yep. Okay. Um, there is... Contrary to God. Wouldn't it be simpler just to say against God's will? Okay. Anything against God's will? Yeah. I... Uh, added a verse, it, it wasn't in any of the ones that we've listed, but in 1 John chapter 2. And this, this might get into categories of sin, perhaps. I, I don't know how to necessarily define it. But when we, when we think of and deal with this idea of sin, this is um, a concept that comes up um, to my mind periodically. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Someone gets there and you go ahead and read it. There's all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. Okay. So this this categorizes or, or separates it out a little bit. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life become kind of the three things. And then if you turn to Genesis 3, <laughs> verse 6, just you were just going there, yeah. mm -hmm. we, we find that, that when Genesis 3, verse 6, we find that Eve, <coughs> when she is Saw. considering, do I follow God or do I follow not God, follow Satan's tempting, my own desires, whatever, um, she addresses these three things, same three. So if someone would read Genesis 3, verse 6, please. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the lust of the flesh, or the desires for flesh, it was good to eat. The, the lust of the eyes, it was delightful to what she would see and the pride of life, that it would make her and then wise or make someone with it. wise. Do what? <laughs> um, it, so, it doesn't really matter who you sit by. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I so said this up here and I can just interrupt the the flow of me as well and not just to uh, sit in the back and cause trouble. So this, this idea of sin then um, kind of, it is a transgression of God's law. It is anything we think, say, or do contrary to, to God's nature. It is um, anything against God's will. 
but we see it taking place in these three areas, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And so I just kind of wanted to point that out and bring it up as well. And that is what the payment of Christ was to deal with, was to take care of. So that's what we are being, one of the things we are being saved from is sin. Okay, we then have the question of what is propitiation? We we'll define that word. That came up in the second, the, very, the, the second sentence of the statement is Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. Payment. Is yep. it payment in place of something or just payment in general? Just payment. Yeah. Atoning sacrifice. Okay. Um, it, it is payment, and in this context, it's payment for sin. Uh, specifically, it, it has the sense of paying off a debt. And so, um, we deserve what? Death. 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 We deserve death. We owe everything, our lives. And yet, Christ is the payment for that. Um, we deserve the wrath of God. But that wrath is appeased or paid for through Christ. Um, in Romans 3, the word is also used of the mercy seat that is atop the Ark of the Covenant as the location where this atonement is made. And so it's that, that meeting with God and the payment for the, the sins that we have committed. Yeah, 2433 in Strong's is said, Be merciful. And uh, to have mercy. Okay. I found one that I like the, the two facets of it. Okay. It said it's the appeasing of wrath mm -hmm. and gaining the favor of the one offended. Okay. Propitiation so carries the idea of flipping their attitude from wrath to um, favor. grace, favor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I, I don't know how right it is, but I really like that yeah. dimension. Because that's what has happened. We are now seen in the righteousness of Christ. We're seen with favor by God. And so, Christ is the propitiation for what? Sin. For, for our sins. Mm -hmm. And, and all sins. sins of the whole world. And so I think someone had made comment about, you know, that's one of the things that sticks out. It's freely available by faith to all mankind. Christ is a propitiation for all sins, not just mine, but for the sins of the whole world. We're going to get to some verses that talk about that one as well. Um, the next definition that I've got listed is believe. Can you define, define believe? Put your faith in something. Okay. Put your faith in something. I would follow that up with how do you define faith? Trust. Mm -hmm. Confident. Okay. Having confidence. Okay. Yeah. So trusting something or having confidence in something. Okay. Um, to be so convinced about something being true that you change your actions. Okay. So the, the basic definition is to accept something as true, or to feel sure that it is true, to have confidence in it. But I think that you touched on something that is very important in this. It's not just that we say that we believe something, that we say that we rely on something, but that we actually do to the point that we act it out, that it changes my actions. Yeah. If, I, if I actually believe something to be true, I'm going to do something based on that. If Jim believes that the plane is going to take off, he'll get onto the plane. If he believes that it's going to crash, he won't get onto the plane. Right? Right. I think you're smart enough to figure that one out. I mean, you would, you would not get on it if you didn't believe it was going to fly? Yeah. Whether it was going to crash? I don't think you want to go flip well. upside down no, every time no, you land. No. Yeah, well, <laughs> you've got people that Believe there is God. Mm -hmm. Believe there is Jesus Christ. Okay. They're not taking the action. Well, the demons. Do do? Well, no. 
that's so I'm saying I don't think you want to take that. Well, well uh, no, no, that, that's, that's a good point. What do they believe? Do you believe the existence or do you believe what he said? Do you, do you acknowledge the existence? That's, that's one thing. But then if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, putting your trust in him for salvation, that's different than believing that he exists, which is the, the point that that passage is making. Well, when, when you have when you believe in something, that the one thing that they use all the time is a chair. Mm -hmm. When you pull out a chair to sit on, you, you don't turn the chair over and check it all out that all the screws are still in there. You sit down in that chair. Yeah. And so you, ha you believe that chair is going to hold you up. Yep. And so your action is just that you sit down there. So the same thing in Christ is yeah, if you it wobbles, believe, you can see why. believe on him, then yeah. you, that faith keep, makes you then go to live your life out for him. But, I mean, there could be a very genet generic uh, belief system. We can believe that this is right or that's wrong or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it, this is a different type of, this is a belief that one man is who he says he is. I, th I think there are times in which we say we believe something and don't, our, our actions don't line up with our, our words. And that, that's, that's really the point that I'm, that's, I'm trying to make. It. I, is it possible to believe something and not take action directly based on that? Yeah. That, that would be a possibility and something that could occur, yes. Um, so it, well, I suppose it doesn't have to be tied to action, but... An example of that might be parachutes. Okay. I totally believe parachutes can let people down out of the sky nice and easy. Mm -hmm. I've never used one. Okay. I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> <laughs> but if it came down to it of trust the parachute or continue in the airplane as it crashes... I would use it first. You would, you would. Okay, I got you. Did you have a, another? Oh, I forgot <laughs> what I was going to say now. I got distracted so, by the parachute. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so one, one thing that I, or note that I have is I don't know always what someone believes. I can only judge based on their actions. And so there are times in which um, someone will say something, and I will have to evaluate, does that line up with, do, do your actions line up with what you're saying? So where that comes into to play, personally, I'm very hesitant to say that someone is not a Christian who claims to be a Christian. I don't necessarily know what they believe. However, I can evaluate based on their actions and say, what you're doing doesn't line up with what I understand the Bible to say a Christian does. So based on what I see, I have my doubts. But I'm not the authority to be able to declare you are or not are not saved because I don't know what you believe. I don't know the heart. Christ is the only one who knows that. But belief is one of those that comes up. And personally, I like the definition that says belief is what you act out, not what you say. And so... Do you believe in the, that the chair is going to support you? You sit in it or you don't. And your actions display what you actually believe. Go ahead. Well, I was, I was thinking about the word, uh, one of the uh, definitions of belief is faith. And you read in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, mm -hmm. the, you know, the faith, the faith the chapter, it was all <coughs> actions that these people took. Mm -hmm. Because of their, they say, their belief and their faith, if we're going to use the word faith as a definition for belief, yeah. that was, that's what, uh, why they're in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Because they actually, they actually uh, acted upon their belief. I'm going off on the rabbit trail, I realize, but one of the ones in, in there that shocks me is that Lot is included. I'm like, wait a minute, Lot, he wasn't 
faithful. He didn't do what God expected. He didn't. And yet, he's included in the, the Hall of Faith. And that chapter is by faith. Who? who? Lot. Lot. Isn't Lot listed in that one? Or am I thinking of a different passage? I don't think they have the Yeah. They have, yeah. Uh -huh. so I'm not seeing any of that here. Lot. <coughs> <laughs> I may be thinking of a different one. <coughs> if I am, my apologies. that's listed is define hope. What is hope? Confident expectation of what God has promised. Okay. Hmm. Uh, Romans 4.3 is what you're thinking of. I'm thinking of Romans 4.3. Thank you just, for looking at that. Just to help you with the rabbit trail you're on. Yeah. <laughs> Managed to get off the rabbit trail. Yeah. What does so the scripture say? The other one, I believe God is reacted to them. Four, three? Um, the beginning of chapter four. No, that's dealing with Abraham. Yeah, and then by the, later it talks about Lot. Let's see. Oh, you're not, you're not talking about hope. No, she she's not. She was trying to look up something else that I was talking about. But no, what what is hope? Uh, you said a confident expectation in the promises of God. Any other definitions? Of to hope? anticipate. Okay. There's another one that came up. All right. To expect. The the. Um, Webster's uh, definition is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. But I think scripturally it's more than a desire, but as you mentioned, a confident expectation. Um, we sometimes sing a song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I think the, the key to hope is what is it based on? Is it based on something that's reliable? Or is it just based on, you know, I hope so, I, I want it to be the case, or is it founded on something solid and sure? Um, and I don't think there's anything more solid or sure than Christ himself. I, I think that as we look at all, all of these words, like believe and hope and things like that, there's the world's view on these words, and then there's the... Uh, Biblical words and uh, mm -hmm. the biblical terms of these words, how it's used in the spiritual side of things. Because you can say, I believe it's going to rain today. Mm -hmm. You know, well, that belief is probably 75% wrong. Often <laughs> <today. laughs> <laughs> You know, and the same way with hope, the way we use hope today. I, I hope I get to go do this thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Boy, they're and, using uh, it but it isn't that confident yeah, expectation is going to happen. It's almost a supposing. Yeah. You know, um, the, the passage that came up on this was, was Romans 8, verse 24 through 26. 
someone would read Romans 8, 24 through 26, please. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In this passage, we have already been saved, and yet we are eagerly anticipating or looking forward to or hoping in, eagerly waiting for the completion of that salvation. And obviously, we'll be getting into more on that in a bit. But that's, that's this idea of hope in the Bible. Like, like you said, in the world, there's a different definition, and it's used in a different way. But scripturally, this is yeah a confident expectation in the promises that God has made. Um, the next question that I had listed was define eternal security. And this was mentioned as one of the, the main things that stands out as well. So what is eternal security? I don't Eternally know. <laughs> secured by God, I guess. I don't know that it's a definition, but it's a saying. Once saved, always saved. Okay. So you don't, you don't have something and then lose it and have it and then lose it and have it and lose it because you just always have that. Okay. I found forever unharmed and the other one was endless safety. Okay. Endless safety. In the context here, destined to be forever with God. Okay. <coughs> destined to be forever. Okay. Any others? This is one of those phrases, um, both the once saved, always saved, and the eternal security, that I generally like to pause and ask someone, what do you mean by that? Um, it's, it's a phrase that's often thrown around in a glib way, in a almost prideful way of, I walked an aisle, once saved, always saved. I said the prayer, once saved, always saved. I, I did whatever, um, and thus I can do whatever I want to. I can live whatever lifestyle I want to because I've got that insurance, as was mentioned before. I've, I've done my part, and so I am good. And I think that when that's the, the idea, we really need to go back to that definition of believe what do you actually believe? What are you trusting in? What are you relying on? Are you trusting in Christ and who he said he was? Or are you trusting in, I said the prayer. I walked the aisle. I was baptized. I did the action. I think that that's, that's where this really comes in. And so I am a little bit hesitant or cautious on the use of this because I want to make sure that we understand what we're talking about. But, once you understand what we're talking about, I love this one. Because, how are we secured? How are we guaranteed? How are we protected once we are saved? Is it by my power? By my ability? By my might? No. It is by the power of God that I am secured. So if He says, you're mine. Who can take me out of his hand? Who can remove me from that? Once he has declared me righteous, who can bring a condemnation against me? Once I have been saved, it's not my ability that keeps me that way. It's him himself. So uh, if we tie this definition back to the idea of belief, and quote, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, then yes, we do conclude once saved, always saved. And then I, I started digging into this one because that is, that is one of those issues of salvation that comes up a lot of can you lose your salvation? What impact does that have? How do I know for sure that I can't? And there are lots of churches that will say you can lose your salvation. 
So I, I kind of wanted to dig, in, dig into this one a little bit. Let's go to John chapter 6. We'll, be, we'll go through several passages in John, so they'll be close together. John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40. This is Jesus talking. And if someone would read it for us. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of everything that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but I will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So here the promise of Christ is if, is if one believes, he will have eternal life. How long is eternal life? So once it starts, it doesn't stop. It's forever. Um, and he will be raised up on the last day. And that's, that's based on the guarantee or the promise of Christ himself, which we've already established. Christ is God. So who can overcome God? Who can beat him? Who has power over him? No one. All right, uh, John chapter 10, 27 through 29. There's one just before this, too. Oh, it's really good. Go ahead. John 5, 25. Okay. John 5, 24. John 5, 24, what you got? Truly, truly, this is Christ speaking again. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life mm -hmm. and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Right. Same, same idea. You already got it. Once you're saved, you have eternal life. It's not a question. It's not a maybe so, whatever. Um, John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. My, she my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Okay. Um, his sheep never perish, same idea as the eternal life, and no one is able to take them out of or snatch them out of his hand. Now, the argument that comes up against that, well, I could remove myself. Well, are you someone? Yes, and he just said no one can. So if you're a one, then you can't either. Um, so that, that is probably one of my favorites that deals with that idea of eternal security or once you are saved, there's no getting out of it. Jesus doesn't let you go. You can't be pulled out. There's no power greater than him to, to remove you. Um, Romans 8. Let's go to Romans 8. I was... Uh, you, you all know my love for rabbit trails. This afternoon, I was getting fairly close to done with this and got started into Romans 8 and spent a couple of hours just in awe of this chapter. And it occurred to me, you know, it, it would be great. We should, we should just dig into Romans chapter 8 and spend a bunch of time here. And then I kept studying and studying and studying. And uh, I like to listen to, to sermons, and so I, I found a couple of sermons. And there was one guy that spent four 45-minute sermons on Romans 8. And um, I'm like, yeah, no, we can't, we can't take that much time to deal with this one. So I'm going to encourage you, go into the whole chapter. Because as you dig into this, it gets really, really good. I'm just going to hit the first and the last, the first verse and the last two verses. So if someone would read uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right. Um, you can't be sentenced. You can't be condemned. That's, that's what that idea of condemnation is. No one can pass judgment on you. No one can 
condemn you if you are in Christ Jesus. And then the, the last two verses, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? I love it too. Um, does that leave any gap for something that can separate us from the love of God? Nothing, uh, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor what's present, nor what's to come, nor power, nor height, nor death. It's pretty obvious. Paul is, is including everything in this. There is nothing that can separate us. And so uh, with that issue of eternal security, or once saved, always saved, if you are in Christ, there is nothing that can get you out of that. Um, I, I had another one in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-7. through 7. We're guarded by the power of God. What was that address again? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-7. through 7. Particularly and, and verse 5, but if you'd go ahead and read the whole 3-7. Do it. I just... I had a note in my Bible here that the context here of Romans 8, beginning in 18 through the end of it, is I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And then he goes into a whole bunch of because. Because the anxious longing, because we know the whole creation, because in hope with it. And so he's just saying our sufferings compared to what we have are yep. nothing. Yep. Has, have you ever thought about the, the commands that he give us, gives us to count it all joy, to all these things that we, you know, when you fall into diverse uh, yep. experiences, how in the world could you count the things that you go through in life that the world just throws through? Because we're just a part of, you know, we're walking through this and we get subjected to it. If we had to worry about our salvation mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, it's, it's counterintuitive to, to that. Once you know that you are securely saved, yeah. then when these things come up, there is where you can have some joy through this because you know what the outcome is going to be. But if you, I think people who worry about, they think that they're any little misstep and they're going to lose their salvation. How could you ever be joyful yeah. in any situation? There, there is no joy. There and is no peace. And yet he commands us to do it. So it would be impossible. Yeah. Uh, First Peter 1, 3 through 7. Someone read those. Do it. I said already read it. You already read it? <laughs> read it out loud for the rest of us. Gotta go get it. Gotta go get it. He's not there. Oh, he's not there. He's not. Go ahead. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Is that word? Through seven. Through seven. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So exactly what you were both talking about, the joy and the, the confidence, even though we face these trials. But like I said, verse 5 really stands out. Uh, it's referring to you who are protected by the power of God through faith for his salvation ready to be revealed at the last times. Like, the power of God is what holds us, and it is uh, awaiting the last times, the end times. And so 
Um, I know I know that this is a little bit of maybe a, a rabbit trail off of going through the passages that we're going to be dealing with, but I think that it is important for us to, to dig into this idea that we are eternally secured in Christ when we have accepted Him. When we are saved, there is nothing that can remove us from that. Now, that's going to have a lot of implications in what happens, but if you are in Christ, you cannot lose it. The question then that remains is, are you in Christ? How do you know? Well, we're going to be hitting on that as we go through these various passages. Yes, ma'am. So, in, our, in the doctrinal statement, and at the end it lists all these verses, mm -hmm. can you tell me which one of those listed refer to the eternal security without me having to look all those up? Which one would have been cited for eternal security? Do you um, it, it comes up a few times, but not, not as explicitly and in-depth as we just dug through. In, so in all those verses, it comes up sort of. <laughs> Nothing specific. Yeah, there is. I'm looking at my notes to find which one would be... Uh, I'm just used to the, the, all those being footnotes to what the paragraph the very, the is very, stating. So the very first one: What do those who believe receive? Eternal life. It's not temporary life. It's not intermittent life. It's eternal life. Yeah, John, uh, 3, 14. John 3, 14 through 18 deals with that idea of eternal life. Okay, uh, um, okay. well, I'll, I'll take note as I go through. Okay. I, I think additionally it's one of those that this, this is prevalent throughout. And as we understand, okay, we are saved by the power of God then it's his power that keeps us. Um, Galatians 3 is another one that pops to my mind that isn't listed in any of these as well, but that, that we are started by the power of the Spirit. We continue not by our own power, but by the power of the Spirit as well. Um, I had a, an additional note. The, this idea of salvation... Um, other than the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of soteriology or salvation is one of the most distinctive between Christianity and all other world religions. Yeah. Um, in other religions, there is no idea of grace through faith or that, that it is unmerited favor of God. In all, basically all the world religions, it is by works that you gain any benefit, whether it's salvation, favor of God, um, hope for a future iteration of life, whether it's Eastern mysticism or Western religions or whatever, in pretty much all the world religions, there is nothing that is anywhere near this idea of hope or this idea of, of a confident expectation that we can be made right with God. Um, you start looking at the major world religions and most of them are works-based. I say most because I'm, I suspect there's probably one or two out there that would make me a liar if I said all of them. But in general, the religions of the world rely on works. They rely on you doing the right thing and maybe, maybe you'll have a, an opportunity. Whereas with the Bible, with Christianity, we find that we have a confident expectation of the fulfillment of what Christ has promised. And that not on our works or our actions, but based on who he is and our simple acceptance of that. Yes, well, I was just thinking about e even in the Catholic faith, Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. when she was asked, are you sure about going to heaven? Uh, she says, well, I sure hope so. Yep. So she still didn't have that. And that wasn't the hope of confident expectation. Even no. that was, she wasn't sure. She didn't. She had done enough yet. Yeah. Really? She didn't know. She based on works. Yep. Had, based on had works. she done enough works? I hope That's, I'm good. That's one yeah. of the. Yeah. You look yeah. at uh, at Islam, uh, Muslims. 
hopefully, maybe, um, you look at any, any of the Eastern religions, if I do enough good to outweigh the bad, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, and it's, it's sad and unfortunate, but that is one of the distinctives. So, I think we're ready to start into these that are, are listed at the bottom. Um, and let's go with that first one, John chapter 3, verses four, 14 through 18. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes will have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that anyone, everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved from him. <coughs> The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Okay. So what do those who believe receive? Eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life. And mm -hmm. no judgment. Okay. Um what was the purpose of God sending Christ according to verse 17? I know that wasn't one of the questions I listed, but what does verse 17 say is the reason or the purpose? But that the world should be saved through him. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not to judge, but to save. And I think that that's, that's something that we need to pay attention to and notice. Um, there's, there's this concept, a, a misunderstanding of who God is, that he's just this, this mean overlord who's trying to, trying to get us and take away all our fun and do, you know, and it's like, he didn't send his son to judge the world in the initial time. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. ultimately, there will be a time of judgment. I'm, we're not denying that. But his purpose was not to judge, but to save. And I would contest, even as we understand in times, God's goal is not to punish. God's desire is that no one would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so even in this um, idea of salvation, we need to be reminded of the, the character of who God is, that he is long-suffering, that he doesn't want people to be punished or judged or have these bad things, but instead that they would be saved. So then, why are any judged? According to this this passage, because they do not believe, verse eighteen. Mm -hmm. So they've already been judged. Been judged. Okay. And and that's that's the key that I wanted to bring out. Um, it's not again. It's not that God is just trying to to get after people, or that He gets upset that they. They don't pick him, they, they pick the other guy, and therefore, I'm just going to be mad at them. No, it's saying that they have already been judged because they have not believed. And so, the reason that anyone is judged is that they don't believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. They don't trust Christ. <clears throat> they have already uh, been judged because of that. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot more that we could pull out from this passage. Um, I've heard full, long sermons on John 3.16, just that one verse, and they, there's a ton packed in there. Um, this idea of, the, it starts out with, Moses lifted up the serpent in the, serpent in the wilderness, so also the Son of Man is lifted up. Um, what's going on with that? Some of this, God did not send to judge, but they will be saved. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, was that the serpent? Moses make to keep the Israelites from being hidden by them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, when they when they had rebelled against God, the God sent serpents, and then they repented, and He had Moses lift up a serpent, and if they would look at the serpent, yeah, yeah. Um, and the only requirement was that they they looked at look it and, it. and believed, and so even even in that, it was, do you trust what God said? 
or not? And that, that's really the determining factor. Do you believe God or not? So I'm wondering if everyone who got bit looked on it and lived, or if some of them did not because they didn't trust or believe. I'd have to go back and examine it, but as I recall, which we've already seen my recollection is not always perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll as we'll as I recall, that there, there were those who did not look and died because they rejected, and there were those who looked and lived, and everyone who looked, looked did live. All right. Anything else on this passage? And let's so go. Did, in that respect, did they live because they were obedient to the command of to look, and then the ones that were disobedient lost their lives? So yep. it, was that a, a form of obedience. obedience to what they were told to do? I, I think so. I Numbers think 41, 6 through <laughs> 9. But I'm not the only one who likes rabbit trails. <laughs> Numbers 21, 6 through, 9. 6 through 9. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if a serpent, if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. And this beginning in 4, um, Became, people became impatient because of the journey. They spoke mm -hmm. against God and Moses. They're Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Tired of their detestable food. Yeah, they were we poor. love this miserable food. <laughs> the food from heaven, that is. Yeah. Yeah. So, was, so was that a, God was requiring an act of obedience? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was simply obedience. Trust. And that's what he said, and yeah. follow his way. And that's why it's a type of Jesus, as we see in John 3, because um, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes may in him have eternal life. So you have to look to Christ for eternal life. There is... There is no other name under heaven, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Everything's consistent. Yep. It is. Old Testament, New Testament. Yep. It's the same. All right, Romans chapter 3. I think we've got time to hit this one. In the yeah, moment. right. Well, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 30. has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by the grace through the redemption of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> whom God displayed publicly Propitiation. Propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and and the justifier of the one who has faith. Jesus. Where then is boasting? It, it is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No. But by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. For it is God the God of Jews only. Is 
he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith is one. So according to this passage, how is someone justified? By faith. Okay. I, I realize that's a, a very short question for a long passage, but that's the point that he's making. And as you recall, Romans is a, a legal legalese, and he's proving his point, and he's working his way through the arguments to make sure that it is completely and abundantly clear. It's not by following the law. It's not by works of the law. In fact, it's apart from the law. Someone is justified by faith. Um, verse 24, we are justified as a gift of His grace. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And then verse 28, we maintain justification is by faith, not by works. Um, and then I, I also found it interesting following that, um, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not also the God of Gentiles? Yes, of Gentiles also. So in this, in this passage, we also see that it is um, apart from the law, it's by faith, and it's available to all people groups. It's not limited just to the Jews. And that's one of the, one of the things that Paul is making mention of as he goes through the book of Romans. The difference between Jews and Gentiles might exist, but that doesn't bar anyone from becoming one in Christ um, from anyone being saved. So what effect does this have on the law? Verse 31. Do we get rid of the law? Is the law worthless and pointless? No. 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 This, this establishes it. This, this does not abolish the law. This establishes it. And so... Paul is, even in that, making the, the point and helping us understand we're not getting rid of the Old Testament. We're not removing that from validity or importance or anything like that. We are actually establishing it. We're understanding it as being fulfilled in Christ. And there's a lot more that comes along with that as well. But, um, mm -hmm. I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I, I think that's where you have to also explain to some, like maybe a new Christian, that some of these things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees considered law was mm. not God's law. Yeah. Because that's where they get into all the trouble of having to do this little thing and that little thing and that little thing. That isn't what he's talking about there. He's talking the Mosaic law. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do have to understand what is the law and what is the addition of traditions of man. Yep, the um, yep. But I, I think that the, the point that Paul is making though that we need to recognize is he's not getting rid of that. God is establishing that and making it even more sure because the law points us to our need for Christ. It points us to the need of salvation. It shows us our sin and that he is Paul is going to be validating that over and over and over again. The law shows us we need him. Go ahead. I can't tell you how many Christians I've heard say that the Old Testament means nothing else in your life. How did they even understand? <laughs> um, what was it? About five years ago, there was a, a major preacher that uh, made the comment it's time to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament, or something to that effect. And I'm probably misquoting him, um, but yeah, that that definitely raised my ire on him. But yeah, we we <laughs> well, the Old Testament. Well, yeah, I mean Romans. Paul is going to express what is the value of the Old Testament. What is the point of it? And and it's not to be done away with. It's not to be rid of. It's fulfilled. It's explained. Go ahead. It's a schoolmaster. Can you explain this part? I still don't know where I understood this. In 25, where it talks about um, in his blood through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because 
and the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Okay. What does it mean he passed over the sins previously committed? So, <clears throat> what... Hang on, let me, let me go back and read it before I open my mouth. <laughs> Okay. So, prior to the coming of Christ, mm -hmm. how was sin dealt with? Um, there, there were sacrifices yeah. in the Old Testament. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And did those, did those remove the sin, no. or did they simply cover them? book of Hebrews is going to deal with that quite a bit as well, that mm -hmm. the Old Testament sacrifices kind of put those on a hold, as it were. And that, that's what this is talking about, is that, that he passed over, he, he, he hasn't dealt with those because Christ was coming. Mm -hmm. And Christ is the, the total payment for all sin, and is going to actually be able to remove those sins, not just cover them over not just kind of put them to the side, but to actually completely and totally do away with them. And so God is righteous. He is he's justified in doing that because of the blood of Christ. Go ahead. I looked up that word. It means to overlook, mm -hmm. to suspend uh, judgment, I guess, remission of punishment for. Mm -hmm. to, to, to take away the punishment for. I, I often you mean uh, quote, God, is God is long suffering. God is long suffering. He doesn't instantly punish us, which is what we deserve. Well, how could he be just in not immediately dealing out retribution? And that's that's what this is dealing with. Even even Old Testament, even in the past, he didn't treat them as they deserved because of Christ. And he's just in doing that because God displayed that publicly as the payment um, through his blood, or in, in his blood, through his blood, to be able to do that. So they had, you know, when they did all the sacrifices stuff, if they were doing faithfully and all that stuff, then this will, Absolutely. they're justified then? I mean, they're, they are ultimately justified through the blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. They were trusting God and what God had said in the Old Testament. And he had given certain instructions and rules about how that was supposed to take place. But it's still the blood of Christ that ultimately pays that penalty. So it's the again, their belief and faith and this shedding of blood at the end was all that stuff. Though they're, though they're faithful and believing in it, then when it but, came to Christ, then they're, they're justified. Right? Can I give a... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Try this on for size. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. God was being entirely fair and just when he did not punish those who sinned in former times. Okay. Okay, okay so you... Yeah. That's talking about the sacrifices. Yeah. Okay. And what 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 uh, what is that translation? Yeah. And that's the NLT. Okay. <coughs> I don't understand so, that. No. Does okay. that answer that one? All yeah. Right. Sweet. Yep. We are going to uh, end on that one, and not next week, but the following week we'll come back and pick it up with Romans chapter five. What day is it? January third. January the 3rd. Mm. All right, let's pray. Dear my Father, Lord, you are amazing. Um, already we see that we don't deserve salvation. We deserve death. We have all failed. And yet you are merciful, you are gracious, you are kind. And you have sent your Son to pay the penalty for us. Thank you. There is no other response than to thank you. 
So Father, we praise you, we worship you because of what you have done. Guide us in the days ahead and help us to live it for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey Paul, what passage was that you read?